Costco? We are small in number, but mighty in voice. There you go. There you go. It's a wonderful morning. Good morning to you all. Good morning to you online. Um, just a few announcements before we get started this morning. Um, there will be a prayer meeting this afternoon at 4 p.m. here in downstairs in the fellowship hall. Um, I want to encourage you to make that a priority. Um, we know that uh, prayer is the weapon that God has given us, and we need to be using that weapon together. And we need to be praying together, and we need to uh, be spending time fellowshipping in, in prayer. And I know that sounds weird that we're fellowship in prayer, but, you know, when you, when you finish that time of prayer, you just know that you have been together and you have been together in, with the Lord. So um, just want to encourage you to come out for that tonight at 4 p.m. down in the fellowship hall. Um, Awana is wrapping up and um, awards night and the pizza party will be this coming Wednesday night. So if you have any questions about that, please talk to Matt or Michelle, and they will give you the information you need for that. Yesterday felt like the one day of spring we get. Yes? I'm, a, I'm convinced we're going to get a week of spring, and then we're going to go from winter to summer. But anyway, um, it's time to start thinking about camp. So we have some opportunities for you at Rock River Christian Camp. Um, you'll see the camp dates. The early bird discount is coming up, which is next Sunday, May 1st. So um, if you have any questions about that, reach out to John, Marissa, or Pastor Paul, and they can give you the information. And along with that, the church has a scholarship program that if your students are looking to go to camp anywhere, um, they can apply for scholarships to go to camp. And so that is also an option. Um, yeah, they're offering $100 scholarship per student for those attending Christian camp this summer. Um, I know in my own life, camp was an amazing, um, amazing, had amazing effects on my heart, my life, my walk with Christ. So um, I want to encourage you that if you have someone in your life who wants to go to camp or that you maybe need to nudge a little bit, follow up with that as well. All right. All right, that is all the announcements we have for this morning. Um, he is risen. He is risen indeed. It's been a week. And yet, we need to continue to remember that he is risen. Let's pray together. Father, I just thank you for this time. I thank you when we can come together to worship you. Lord, you... You are amazing, and you have showed us over and over again in our lives your goodness, your mercy, your forgiveness. But God, not only do we praise you for what you've done, Lord, we praise you for who you are. So God, as we worship this morning, may our voices be lifted high. May we make that joyful noise to lift our voices in worship to you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me.
when the sun's shining down on me when the world's all as it should be blessed be your name blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering though there's pain in the offering blessed be your name the land. 
Shout to the Lord. Read it with me. All the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. open your 
Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, page 118 in your uh, pew Bible. Ephesians chapter 2, we start at verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages we might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith, this is not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. That's today's reading. You bow in prayer with me, please. Father God, I just praise you today. I thank you, Lord, for the love you have for us. I thank you, Lord, that uh, you have shown us this great gift of salvation through Jesus. And now I just lift up uh, Larry to you, Lord. I know that uh, your spirit is working mightily in him and, and will guide his words. And just uh, let us listen and let us take heed of what he has to say and apply it to our lives. We praise you, we honor you, we bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. No. I have a 12 page of my own notes to use, okay. so I don't need yeah, I don't need those two. Maybe I'll use some of the others sometime. Good morning. You know, you're a good-looking crowd, especially from up here. I can see your faces. I usually sit in the back, and I'll see you in the back of your head. So, When uh, John asked me to preach, called me up and asked if I, if I would preach this Sunday, um, a lot of things went through my head in about five seconds. I didn't know I could think that fast. But I said, sure. I said, I'll charge you twice as much as I did last time, though. Maybe three times, because I had to teach Sunday school, too. But anyway. At first, I thought maybe I'd teach the whole book of Romans verse by verse. <laughs> and I said, well, if I have four to five hours, maybe I'd get through it. But no, I didn't say that. So what I try to do when I'm asked to preach is figure out what particular verses, especially that I've applied in my own life, that had, had the biggest impact, not only just for my daily walk with Christ, but also in my service to him and being able to service you guys. So my two verses, even though they're not related to Ephesians here, but we'll see that they are, is in Romans 12, 1 and 2. I preached on this before, but this is not the same sermon by any stretch of the imagination as what it was before. I think any pastor who has said that will agree with me, hopefully. I want to read Paul's conclusion to his previous 11 chapters in Romans. Romans, to me, can be divided into three sections. The first eight chapters, one through eight, are all doctrinal. By that, I mean Paul is trying to teach us something about our relationship with Christ and how is it we should be walked now. 9, 10, 11 are called dispensational because he deals with the people of Israel in particular. 
Is God finished with Israel? Is he finished with the Jews? And Paul said, no, not in any way. The promises that God gave to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the way back to David will yet be fulfilled. The church has not taken its place. I know there are some who go by what they call replacement theology. They say that the church today is the Israel of the Old Testament, because there are some passages that seem to indicate. But if you look at 9, 10, 11, you see that we're actually, we're, we're foreigners, we're grafted into this branch, and we are there only because of the grace of God and his mercy upon us. So this is really not what we're talking about. But then you get into 12 through 16, I call them devotional. There are four, therefore, passages in Romans. We're not going to look at all of them. I'm just going to list them. Chapter 2, verse 1, talks about the moral person, how he's also condemned. Chapter 5 tells us that we have been justified by faith in Christ. Chapter 8 tells us there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And this passage today in Romans 12 summarizes, in my mind, everything that Paul has given us previously. Whenever you've seen a therefore in Paul, look previously what he has said because he's asking us to have some kind of moral response to a doctrinal teaching he's just given us. And that's what Paul is doing here. He's summarizing the first 11 chapters in these two verses, I think. Let's read them. I'm reading from the New American Standard because that's why I studied at Moody. Besides, this is a gift from the Moody Alumni Association for having survived 40 years before I had an anniversary. And it's by Charles Caldwell Wright, and it's also a new American. It says right, you got my name right in the front. Yeah, right there, see? It seems like my writing too, but it's not, but anyway. Paul says, this is in relation to others, ourselves rather. Therefore, why is it there? I urge you, Brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable, and perfect. Well, right away, Paul gives us some difficulties here. What does he say? How are we to present our bodies? In what way? Living and holy. They're connected. All the Old Testament sacrifices, including the grain offerings, were always a result of what? Death. But now Paul is asking us to be living sacrifices. I think it goes along with Galatians say we die to ourselves daily and can take up his cross and go with him. To a certain extent, I think that's what he's asking us here to do. But also remember he's asking, he's, who's he, whom is he addressing here? Anybody? He used the word brethren. So he's talking about believers in Christ. And he's talking about them in a way that says that you have received mercies of God, which are too innumerable to mention. And that's all in the previous 11 chapters. William R. Newell, who was an assistant superintendent at Moody, lists nine various aspects of mercy. You can probably list others, but I think they're all encapsulated in what Paul is asking us to do here. What is it that are the mercies of God? Number one, justification, including pardon, Removal of sins from us, trespasses never to be reckoned a standing in Christ, being made the righteousness of God in him. Identification. Taking out of Adam by death with Christ, dead to sin and to law, and now in Christ. Under grace, not law. Fruit unto, unto God, unto sanctification, made possible. The spirit indwelling, no condemnation, Romans 8.1. Freedom from the law of sin, we are witnesses to the sonship and heirship that we have. Help in infirmity, and in any present sufferings, 
are a way to share Christ's glory. Divine election, our final conforming to Christ's image as his brethren. God's settled purpose in which believers already glorified in God's spirit. Number seven, coming glory beyond any comparison with present sufferings. No separation possible. God loved us in Christ. Confidence in God's faithfulness, confirmed by his revealed plans for national Israel in the previous three chapters. So what is he asking us to do as being the living sacrifice? What is he asking us to do? If we are a living sacrifice, how are we to act? What are we supposed to be doing? If we are a living sacrifice, what does that mean? What does it mean to you? What does it mean to me? It means that every day I'm to live for Christ, not for myself. And while unfortunately, I still had old nature rolling around in my brain. <clears throat> I can't seem to get rid of him. And I won't get rid of him until God comes and takes me home, either through death on this time or the rapture of the church. Yes, I'm a pre-male preacher of raptures, and I make no apologies. If you have a difference, you can talk about it later, and I'll show you how you're wrong. <laughs> but then again, maybe you're showing me how I'm wrong. It's interesting. He says, present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God. If you are doing this, then you are acceptable to God. No matter what you may think, it's difficult. Why? Because every morning when I get up, and I speak from experience, every time I look in that mirror in the morning, that's not the same person I went to bed with. <laughs> Something has changed. Hopefully, I'm changing from glory to glory that we will understand that my sanctification is an ongoing process, but at the same time, it is what? Something that I am doing, but what God. Sorry, I hit my mic. I'm not used to being there, so. Sorry about that. If I blew your eardrums, we're good. I lost my thought. That's all right. We'll probably wouldn't work anything anyway. It is your spiritual worship of service. And I don't like that word spiritual. It's used there. Some of you have another word. What word is that? When you're by what's most of you use the New International Version, right? When I teach, I use the Coleman Standard Bible, the Christian Standard Bible, excuse me. Acceptable, reasonable. The word that's used there is a word where we get logical. And he's saying that based upon the mercies that you have seen that God had listed in these first 11 chapters, how are we to act? We're to act like we have received mercies. And because of it's, it's humans, well, you got to be careful here. There's a new thought in my head. Humans are really the only animals that can use reason to accomplish things. And that's why we are called at the very beginning in Genesis living souls. We have rationality amongst us that we can decide whether or not we want to do something. But at the same time, if our old nature is there, what are we doing? Things that are not acceptable to God. But he says we are to do these things because of the fact that we are new and living creatures in Christ. And we can act what? In the proper way that God wants us to do. There's probably something down there I forgot I should kind of use. But anyway, Christians are the ones that are addressed. <clears throat> And Paul's words are a call to action. He doesn't demand. He could have, he had, as, a, as an apostle, he had the authority to demand this kind of action from the believers. But he didn't. What did he say? Some of you has, a, I implore you. Some say, I, am, I beseech you. I'm asking. I'm getting down on my hands and knees begging you to act this way because of the mercies that God has given you. And because of that, now you can act that way. But it's still hard. I don't care what you say, it's hard. If it isn't hard, you're not doing it right. You're ignoring the, what I consider 
the impetus of the Holy Spirit. We're told not to grieve the Holy Spirit, nor to quench him. Quench means to put out the fire that he's trying to ingenerate it within you so you can live a life that is acceptable and good and holy to God. But unfortunately, we always carry a water bottle around with us somewhere and want to pour something on somebody. Paul's words are those of urging or exhortation. Why? Because of utmost importance to God. God does not judge men on outward appearances, but on the heart. That's why I had Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 9 read. Because Paul lists the fact that we were formerly, we were formerly dead in our trespasses and sins. And we followed who? The prince of the power of the air. The one who is working even now within the world system, the generation system. Then we get to verse 4. And as Pastor John told me, he had a pathology professor who said, whenever you come to this, this passage, it says, but God, but God. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, but God being alive. And showed his love towards us by giving his son. So that in ages to come, I think that the whole, most of us know Ephesians 2, 8, 9. We probably memorized it years and years ago. For by grace are you saved through faith out of every cell, so forth, so on. But why did he do all that in verses 4 through 6? I think they're encapsulated in verse 7. What does verse 7 say? So that in the ages to come, God to demonstrate his mercy... So when we get to the judgment seat of Christ and people are saying, how come you didn't save me? God said, you had just as much opportunity as everybody else, but you refused. How can you save them? Because they had faith in me. It gets a little hairy when you get into theology in this area. I understand that. I'm sorry. But it's the fact that this is something that God has done for us and to us. That's why it says, in 8 and 9, for by grace are you saved through faith or by means of whatever word you want to translate that word for. For, you, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves, meaning you had no action in it whatsoever except faith. Turn to Romans chapter 1. This encapsulates Paul's whole theme throughout the entire book. Verses 16 and 17. Paul tells us, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Grace is both a means and a motivation by heeding Paul's exhortation. Act on these mercies. His eternal plan to save men from their sins, to declare them righteous, and to assure them of the hope of glory. He employs man's disobedience as occasion for his grace. Divine election, which enables him to bless men apart from their unworthiness and sin. God's mercy is personified in the person of Jesus Christ, who suffered and died for sinners. God's mercy is evident in the life of the Christian in whom his spirit dwells and through whom he is working out his purposes. All of God's blessings are the result of his grace and manifestation of his mercy. Yeah, that is the next page over. Sometimes I get mixed up. What is the goal of a Christian's action in pleasing God? What's his goal? What's your goal in obeying God's will for you? What, what, is, what is your goal? 
That's not a rhetorical question. What is, I, I, I'm not putting anybody in the spot, but think about that. What is your goal in doing this? Is it for self-aggrandizement? To make you feel better than somebody else? If it is, then you're not doing it for the right reason. What should be the reason that we do these things? Because of the mercy that God has given us. Pleasing God goes much further than this. It avoids anything that might not please him. It searches for ways to please him. Not only were it to be a living sacrifice, what also were it to be? A living and holy sacrifice. What does holy mean? It's also not a rhetorical question. I'm sorry. Yes, Nancy? Yes. It has both a positive and a negative thing. Positive means to be dedicated to. To be dedicated to God and his mission. Negative, to be separated from. Meaning that we're to separate ourselves from the world. That's what he told us right here in Ephesians, right? We are walking in this world, but we're not to be a part of it. So now we can know that this is our logical conclusion based upon his mercies of how we should be acting and how it is that we can be a living and holy sacrifice for him. Now we come to verse 2. You thought I was about done, didn't you? What does verse 2 say? At the very beginning, what's that, what's that first word? But, most translations, some have and, but do not be conformed to this world, but what? Be transformed. Turn to Matthew 17, verse 2. This is a Greek word, it's metamorpho or metamorphosis. I like to use the illustration of a caterpillar. How he, when he's in the pupa stage, what does he want to do? You seen these nature movies? He's always eating. He's feeding his body. And what does he get? He gets fat, he spreads his skin. But then there's a certain point where this caterpillar realizes this is where God wants me to stop. So then what does he do? Not a cocoon. Boz formed cocoons. He forms a chrysalis, which is really an outside part of his body. What happens within that chrysalis? Anybody know? Any biology people? What happens when a caterpillar gets this chrysalis? It releases enzymes, and his whole body turns to jelly. So if you split one open too soon, all is going to come out is a bunch of goo. But by in time, that chrysalis will change that caterpillar to a butterfly. When a butterfly emerges, what is the butterfly's main goal in his life? Or make more of himself. And that's what we should be doing. We were changed. We were changed from that thing over here. Now we're to this thing over here. What is it different about this thing over here? What does the Great Commission say in Matthew 28? What did we do? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. So, but now here Paul says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That transform is the same word, Matthew 17, verses 1 and 2. Somebody want to read that for me? You thought I was going to do it for you. I'm going to take a drink of water. Matthew 17, verses 1 and 2. What is Matthew 17? First nine verses deal with the transfiguration of Christ, right? He takes Peter, James, and John up on a mountain, and all of a sudden he began to do what? Transfigured. It's the same Greek word. And it's only two places you find in the New Testament. That word transform. Metamorpho. There's only two places. 
So he changed from what he veiled, his glory, to that which is going to be and is now his true glory. He is, he's been, because of his resurrection, which was, I don't want to say celebrated last week, but we commemorated. It's a time of joy because we know now that which he came here to do on earth as, a, as Christ was fulfilled in his death, but that wasn't sufficient. He had to be raised anew. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 5, you want to know about the gospel. Now he says, be transformed. How? How are we to be transformed? I'm done with that one. That way I can't use it again. By doing what? What does that word renew mean? Turn to Titus 3, 5. The only other instance where this word renew is used. Actually start, I'll look it up myself. I'll read it for you. Timothy, Titus, there it is. <clears throat> Starting with, actually, we'll start with verse 4. And you've got another one of those buts. Com dramatic comparison. But when the kindness of our God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. How are we renewed? How do we renew our minds? It's interesting that one of the difficulties it has in school, and I'm sure some of these others who didn't have that problem, but sometimes you, if, especially if you go into a place like Moody Bible Institute or even Trinity Seminary or college or whatever, you, you often substitute your studying of the word for that time of your devotions. Why? It's extra work. You're taking 18, 16 hours already. The second year I had Greek, man, was that a bum. That was hard. I still don't know any Greek. Well, I did a little bit, but it's the fact that we substitute one thing for the other. And this is not what he's wanting. When it says that we're to do what? Timothy tells us what we're to do. Study to show ourselves approved unto God, which is what? Reasonable. There's that word again. Reasonable. Service. Why? Because God has been so merciful to us as individuals. What time is it? Okay. I don't know what that. I don't know if I have 45 minutes or four to five hours. That's why I had 16 pages of notes. But anyway. I know. But I don't throw humor out there. I fall on my face. But anyway. So what is he asking us to do here? Renew our minds. And renewing our minds is only possible because the Holy Spirit is the one who does it for us. As we yield to him. That's hard. I'm sorry. Life gets in the way. Not only that, what else gets in the way? What are the three, three things that weigh against us? The world. That's a system. The flesh. Our old nature. And the devil. What does it say in Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 9? We were formerly just like all these other people. We followed the age, the eon, the age that is now here because Satan is in control of this earth. Did you know that? Satan is in control of this earth. But praise unto God. Christ has taken that away from us through his life, death, burial, and resurrection. He's taking care of that. He said, now you have power, which is really what he's talking about here. What is this power that we have? Think of John chapter 1, starting about verse 14. To everyone who believed on him, meaning the word, God gave him, some translations say authority, I like the word power, power to overcome those things in your nature. And I've often told my class, 
Sunday school class. I think that we have a greater moral responsibility today as Christians than the Old Testament saints have. Why? Why is it that we have a greater moral responsibility? Because we have the Holy Spirit living within us to empower us, to enable us, to equip us, to energize us, whatever ease you want to use on there. But he is the one that gives us this capacity, this ability to do these things. First, note that the words of verse 2 are closely linked with what Paul had just said in verse 1. The and or but of verse 2 links this verse with verse 1. Presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice to God should result in the transformation of our lives as called for in verse 2. The offering of ourselves to God is a choice which determines whom we will serve and whom we will follow. Second, the commitment to offer our lives to God as a sacrifice of thanksgiving is intended to result in a process of change. Just as we go for the transformation, something in us should be changed. When the gospel is proclaimed, repentance is required. Repentance is a turning around, a change in thinking and behaving. The commitment to serve God as a sacrificial offering is also a commitment to change. This change involves the mind and what will shape our thinking. The Gentile mind is darkened and distorted. It must change. Yeah, okay. I print on both sides the same paper, then I forget where I'm at. What is it he's asking? He said, <clears throat> excuse me. And by being transformed by renewing our minds, what is the end result? As it says in the end of verse 2. So that you may, can, prove what the will of God is. That which is good. I know you're not supposed to stick your hand in your pockets. I told you that in seminary class. But even the professor did that. I got after it one time. But anyway. Prove what the will of God is. That which is good and acceptable and perfect. The commitment to become a living sacrifice is a commitment to change. It is a commitment to a radical change, a reversal of our thinking and values of our motives and methods. It is not a minor repair, but a tearing down and complete rebuilding. This change is evidence in the instruction Paul gives us in the rest of the Romans. Becoming a living sacrifice is a commitment to being changed. If you don't want to be changed, I don't think your commitment to Christ can be true. I don't think it can be what God desires for you to do. Not the reason he gave you his son. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. That whosoever or whomever believes in him should not perish but have, I don't like to use the word eternal. I like to use the word everlasting. We'll have everlasting life. It is not we who change ourselves. In the final analysis, our thinking will be shaped by something or someone outside ourselves. No, I won't use that. I was going to use my son as an illustration, but that's dangerous. Uh, in our sin and unbelief, we like to think of ourselves as free thinkers. We like to think that nobody is really controlling us. In reality, we are only thinking like Satan and like the fallen world system in which you live. Our culture constantly seeks to shape us like teenage children. Got a few out there? Sorry. We think we are expressing our individuality and independence when we differ with God. 
In reality, we're merely following the world, the flesh, and the devil in rebellion and unbelief. When we give our lives to God, we give ourselves over to his influence and control. When we turn to God in obedience, we turn away from the world, uh, from the world shaping influence on us. Its influence should diminish, and God's infinite wisdom, contained in Scripture and conveyed by His Spirit, should begin to transform our thinking and our actions. Giving our lives to God as a living sacrifice is a decision to be shaped and influenced by God and not by our fallen world. Guess I'm done. No. I'm done with my notes. So when we get down to the, to the essence of what Paul is asking us to do here, and I said, I think this, therefore, is a conclusion of all the previous 11 chapters, how Paul has interacted with us, or Jesus Christ, rather, has interacted with us. At the very beginning, what does it say that in the first chapter? There's a condemnation to the, to the world, right? Because we have changed that which was the creator, and worshiping the creator, to that which has been made, the creation. Paul condemns it three times. It says that he gave, Lord, gave them over or gave them up to their depraved minds. So what should we be doing then? We should be changing. Two, chapter 2, verse 1 says, Therefore, you who are moral preachers, moral creatures, not preachers, <sighs> moral creatures, should do what? You are without excuse because you have turned away from the created, the creator to something that was created. And we've been doing this since the beginning. Adam and Eve did that. Nobody's objecting to what I said. Come on. You don't agree. As I said in my Sunday school class, are there any comments, questions, or criticisms? Well, let's hold your criticism to later. After I get done here. But what is Paul saying there in 2 1? You are, even you moral people who acted on the evidence that God gave us, it says in verse 18, that the created world gives evidence of the power and majesty of God. And if we will accept that, then he will give us, I believe, he'll give us more light to understand what he wants of us. Now we come to what I think is the pinnacle of Paul's theology here in Romans, which I, this is my personal opinion. Is the greatest theological treatise concerning our relationship with Jesus Christ there is. If I was going to pick five books out of the Bible, I could have only those. I pick Genesis, Daniel, John, Romans, and Revelation. That's my opinion. Because I think Genesis gives us, as I have one of my my whiteboard in my room, I said I had the four basic aspects of worldview that we have to have as Christians. One is origin. Second is meaning. Why are we here? Third is morality. How should we act knowing these things? And that's exactly what Paul is telling us here. And what's the last one? Destiny. They have to be independent of each other but they're also interlocked as to the necessity of having a proper worldview. And that's what Paul is really telling us here, that we haven't had that proper worldview. That's why I had Ephesians 1, chapter 2, verses 1 through 9 read. We were formerly, but we are not now, but only because of the mercies and grace that God has given us. I contemplate that throughout the day as I'm driving And I have to look, like I said, when I get up in the morning, that's not the same face of the person I went to bed with. Hopefully it's a better person than I did before. But I know that I'm going to stub my toe. I've been in this house for like 25 years. The same furniture is there, the same place. Sometimes I get up in the middle of the night for whatever reason, smack my toe. Because I don't let the light. And that's really what God's word is, the light, right? 
What does it say in Psalms? Thy word is a what? I'm sorry, I got three voices. I can barely hear on my own. What, what is it? What is God's word to us? And a unto my path. 99% of the moral activity you should be doing, in my estimate, again, my estimation, we can debate it, is found in this word. That's why Paul said we are to study to show ourselves approved unto God. Workmen who do not have to be ashamed. And if we are doing these things, if we're allowing the Holy Spirit to transform our minds, transforming, and that's what Paul did when he, or Jesus did when we came to this point in time. Point, I got to be careful how hard to hit. This, I use that word punctiliar. You can look it up on your funk wagon on your dictionary. It's that particular point in time when you have accepted Christ as Savior. You admitted to yourself that I am a sinner. I can do nothing to, to merit salvation. I believe that the only way possible is through faith in Jesus Christ. And it's not merely an intellectual assent, but rather is a heartfelt reality in our minds. And then I've confessed my sins at that point in time, even no matter how long it was. Mine happened in October 1968 before I got shipped overseas. I knelt down with a pastor at Homewood Free Church and accepted Christ as my Savior. I did not have him as my Lord. When I got out in 1970, I met my wife, and I praise the Lord that I met her every day because it was through her life that I came to realize my life is not the way it should be. So in July, of night, we were married in September 1971 in the old church. In July of 1972, Pastor Hedlund was here, and I walked, not here, over there. It's not there anymore. You can't see it. Those who are long-time people wouldn't know what it is. I walked out that, to, the, to the front, and I knelt down. <sighs> and I accepted the Lord as my, my Savior as my Lord. We often use the word Lord and Savior, but I think it has to be reversed. We can't have him as Lord until we have him as our Savior. But the two, unfortunately, can be separated in our minds and our actions. We can always have him as our Savior, but unless we have him as our Lord, leading us, transforming our minds by the renewing of what? Studying God's word, allowing the Holy Spirit to fill us, to enlighten us, to empower us. All these things that Paul is talking here in these two verses, I think encapsulates everything that we really need to be doing as Christians. Are there other things? Yes. But if we're doing these things, these things right here, the rest of it, in my estimation, becomes not easier, but more able to be done. Christian life is never told that we're going to have an easy life. Get that out of your little head right now. But by the same token, it is a capable life that God can give us through faith in him as we walk with him. That's why I had the title, How Then Shall We Live? This was actually the title of a book by Dr. Francis Schaeffer back in 1977 when I graduated Moody. I read the book. His son, Frankie, made a 10-part series of videos out of this, I think. But one of the Francis Schaeffer's, <clears throat> those of you who don't know who he was or is, was a, a very, very enlightened apologist for the Christian faith. He started a Brie Fellowship over in Switzerland, or Sweet, yeah, Switzerland, uh, when he would take intellectually people. There was one time I thought I was smart enough to go there, but I knew it. As soon as I started thinking about it, I knew I wasn't. But anyway... He said, how then shall we live? Shall we live like the world? Which is really what this verse 2 says, be not conformed. It actually has a fullest translation, I think, is better because it says, do not let the world squeeze you into its mold. I like to use the illustration of the uh, <clears throat> Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. 
when I was in seventh, eighth grade, we, one year we'd go to Chicago for Science and Museum and go to, and then next year we'd go to Springfield. I remember going there and he put this money on this little machine and this little, hopefully, <laughs> fully formed elephant or something would come out because it was in, injected. So it, that's what I use this. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. So out of that came, unfortunately, a lot of times the trunk was missing or an ear is partially gone. Why? Because it's not complete. That's why I think God wants us to view our lives here on earth. Do not let the world squeeze you into its mold, but rather be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let's pray. Father God, I pray that these words that I have given have not been mine, but yours that you have given me to speak. I fully realize I'm not going to hit every person here today. But if I, through your Holy Spirit, can touch one life, it will have been worth all that I've said. But through all of this, Father, may you be glorified. May you be lifted up. May we be able to walk out of here today and say that we have truly met with the King today and let us walk accordingly. In Jesus' great name, I pray with thanksgiving. Amen. Thank you. Let's stand together as we close.
Let us pray. May the Lord God of Jesus Christ keep us, sustain us. May we be able to walk today and say we've walked with the King and have been a blessing to those around us. Until we meet again, in Christ's name, amen.